reading from 1 Peter, chapter 4, and from verse 12 to 19. My dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering, as if something unusual were happening to you. Rather, be glad that you are sharing Christ's sufferings, so that you may be full of joy when his glory is revealed. Happy are you if you are insulted because you are Christ's followers. It means that the glorious Spirit, the Spirit of God, is resting on you. If any of you suffer, it must not be because you are a murderer or a thief or a criminal or a meddler in other people's affairs. However, if you suffer because you are a Christian, Don't be ashamed of it, but thank God that you bear Christ's name. The time has come for judgment to begin, and God's own people are the first to be judged. If it starts with us, how will it end with those who do not believe the good news from God? As the scripture says, it's difficult for good people to be saved. What then will become of the godless sinner? So then those who suffer because it is God's will for them should by their good actions trust themselves completely to their creator who always keeps his promise. This is the word of the Lord. I guess that we probably all done it at some point or another. As we try to take the tin out of the hot oven, our hand has touched the side and we've burned it. Or perhaps we've caught a finger in the steam from the kettle if we tried to get it before it had finished boiling. And it was painful. It hurt. It left a mark on us somewhere. Even though we moved quickly and put it under cold water or rubbed in some cream. Therefore, we can understand when Peter writes about a fiery trial, a difficult experience, a painful one, an experience we try to avoid or or get away from as quickly as we can. So what does Peter say to us about such painful moments? What does he say that can help us to face them? Well, the first thing he says is that ambassadors of Christ share in Christ's sufferings. And therefore, first he says, don't be surprised. Do you remember on the last night of his life, before his crucifixion, Jesus spent quite a long time talking with his disciples, sharing his heart with them. And among what he taught them, he said this, if the world hates you, Just remember it hated me first. If people persecuted me, they'll persecute you also. In this world, you will have trouble. And so Peter says, don't be surprised. Remember what our Lord taught us. The Apostle Paul writes of facing trials as a messenger of the gospel as he travelled across Turkey. People opposed him. Some people tried to shout him down. Others tried to run him out of town. And in one place they stoned him and left him for dead. Now Paul had to face all of those. He had to go through all of those trials. And yet he says, God kept me. God preserved. may not happen to us exactly in those ways, or even to that extent. It might simply be that someone laughs at us when we say we go to church. They insult us, perhaps, or treat us unfairly because of our belief in Christ. As some Christians have begun to discover in recent months in the UK, a local counsellor, in Northampton, 
a languages teacher in Kent, a social worker in Lambeth. The word trial means adversity and trouble that test our faith and build our character. It also means a temptation to do wrong. And sometimes the same fiery trial can do both of those things. It can build faith and develop character as we stand firm in faith. But at the same time, it can tempt us to sin. So, for example, an insult might develop patience within us. Or it might provoke us to respond in the same kind of way. And injustice might lead us to lean more fully upon God. Or it might cause us to become angry. Persecution. We might stand strong to the end. Or it might break us. But whenever it comes, and however the fiery trial to faith comes... It should not surprise us. It's not something strange in the Christian life. And what Peter says is that when we suffer because we are Christians, he's not dealing with all sorts of different kinds of of troubles and sufferings that might happen in the world. He's dealing with those things we suffer because of our faith in Christ. He says, in those moments, remember, we share in the sufferings of Christ. Rejoice, he says. (laughs) Rejoice. In as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ. And we use that word, in as much, when we want to explain how something can be true. And so Peter wants to explain why we should not be surprised and even how we can be glad when we face the fiery trial. It's because we share the sufferings of Christ. Now, we need to be clear that there are some of Christ's sufferings that are unique. When he suffered and died for our sins, we have no part in that. He only is the saviour of the world. He only is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He and he alone could, and thank God he did, carry our sins in his body. We have no part in that suffering at all. He did it perfectly. There's nothing that we need to add. There is nothing that we can add to that. And yet there is an aspect of his sufferings in which we can share. In life, he suffered because he chose always to obey the Father. He said, if they hated me, they will hate you too. He suffered in his temptation. He suffered as a holy man living in a sinful world. He suffered when he was accused, when he was betrayed, when he was denied. And if we intend to resist temptation, we may suffer in the fight. When we are insulted because we obey Christ, we will suffer. When we want to live holy lives in this world, the sinfulness of this world will distress us. And it is in this that we share in the sufferings of Christ. And yet, praise God, not forever. We share in the sufferings of Christ now, but verse 13 says we will rejoice when his glory is revealed. The day when Jesus comes again. The day when he comes on the clouds, when he comes in his glory, when he comes in his power, when he raises us from the dead, 
when he judges the world, when he gets rid of all injustice, when every knee bows and honors him. The day is coming and the glory of Jesus will be revealed and the whole world will see it and bow at his feet. Oh, one person agrees with me. How great our joy on that day. Because finally, the Lord Jesus will receive the honor that he is due. And I believe that the extent of the overflow of joy that we have on that day will match the depths of the sadness we feel today when his name is laughed at and taken in vain. If that doesn't sadden us and trouble us, then I think our joy will be quite small. But if it does trouble us, when the name of Jesus is blasphemed, when the name of Jesus is honored and every knee bows before him, then our joy will be great. Can you see how, in one sense, we need to suffer today if we would have that overflow of joy when his glory is revealed? And that's how we prepare for trials. That's how we face them when they come. It's how we live in times of the fiery trial, the painful stuff. We remember, ah, we are sharing in the sufferings of Christ. And we're looking forward to the day when his glory is revealed. Secondly, ambassadors of Christ are therefore not to be ashamed. We might be a little surprised when we read verse 14. If you're insulted for the name of Christ, ha, you're happy. You are. I mean, insults come in many ways. Somebody might just raise their eyebrows at us, make a sarcastic comment, or just laugh. And it happens. It can happen to some of us at home. It can happen in the office or wherever our place of work is. It can happen when we go out shopping. It can happen always anywhere. But remember, Peter is writing here that the insults that we suffer because of the name of Christ. It's the way people speak to you sometimes because you are a Christian. It might be to poke fun at your belief might be to accuse you of being intolerant. And what does Peter say? Well, according to the Good News Bible, you're happy. Not quite sure I feel that way. Which is probably why I prefer the New International Version that says you are blessed. I mean, even then I'm struggling a little bit, but I can begin to understand that as I read on. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because... The spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. See, insults are not pleasant. Suffering is not enjoyable. Persecution is fiery. But here is God's blessing for us in the time of trial. The spirit of glory and of God rests upon us. You know, the prophet Isaiah said that the Spirit would rest upon the coming Messiah. And at the baptism of Jesus, John the Baptist declares, I saw the Spirit of God descend and rest upon him. So what an encouragement to us then, that in our times of persecution, of suffering, of the fiery trial, the Spirit of God rests upon us. The Spirit of glory and of God. I take that phrase from our older translation because I think it's important. We have two words that express one thought. Grammatically, it's called hendiodus. It means one through two. So two words joined by and expresses one idea. So we might say a warm and friendly person. We might say a wet and wild storm. And the two words create that one thought and uh, image for us in our minds. And here it is the spirit of glory and of God. Therefore, the spirit of the glorious God. 
God who is amazing, wonderful, awe-inspiring, the glorious God. And for me, that word glory is like the sum total of all that God is. Put all of the great attributes of God together. His holiness, his power, his grace, his knowledge, his kindness, his goodness, and all the rest of them. Now you just begin to see a glimpse of the glory of God. Peter says, the spirit of the glorious God rests upon you. Ha, now I can see why. I'm blessed. Because when I have to cope with that insult, when I face that fiery trial, God grants this great favour to me that his spirit rests upon me and ministers to me strength and help through the wisdom and the grace and the patience and the kindness of God. And therefore Peter says, be prepared to suffer but only because you are Christians. That is just one of only three occasions where that word appears in the New Testament. It was a title or nickname given to the disciples of Jesus by Gentiles. But very quickly, the, the, the disciples of Christ recognized and accepted it as a title of honor. You know, people have recognized that there's something about our lives that is like him. So what an honor to be called by his name. And so Peter says, let us suffer only for that reason, that we bear this name of Christ. And remember, he did no wrong. So when you're accused of doing something wrong as a Christian, let that be a false accusation. Don't ever be accused of murder or even of theft. Don't be accused of being a criminal or of meddling in somebody else's business. Now, we're not perfect, don't we? We make the mistakes, don't we? But the thing is, if someone knows you're a Christian, they're going to watch. And they're going to watch to see when you don't get it right. And they'll be quick to let you know. So Peter's saying we need to be on our guard. We need to be prepared. We need to be equipped so that we don't suffer for doing wrong, only for being Christians. And when we do, then we glorify God that we bear the name of Christ. And now that's the third time in these verses that he has mentioned the name of Christ. And to bear the name of Christ, to be known as a Christian, will not always be easy. As Peter says, we may find we get insulted. We might find we face persecution. But Peter tells us not to be surprised. Not to think that it's strange. Not to be ashamed. But in it to glorify God. Let us own the name of Jesus. Let us be proud to be called Christian. And let us glorify God in that name. That means because we bear the name of Christ, we live in a certain way that will bring glory to God. That's how we prepare for trial. This is how we face trials when they come. It's how we live in the time of the fiery trial, the painful stuff. We're proud to bear the name of Christ and we seek to glorify God by the way we carry his name. Thirdly, ambassadors of Christ commit themselves to God and do good. In other words, we simply copy God our master. It's what Jesus did. When he suffered, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. And now we're told simply, do the same. Let us commit ourselves to the Lord. The word means simply to deposit with. 
you deposit your money or your paycheck with the banker because you trust them to look after it. People put their valuables into a safety deposit box because they trust the company to keep it safe. Which is why 50 years ago, the Hatton jewellery heist took everyone by surprise. Somehow, thieves had managed to get in and people's valuables had been stolen. But when we deposit our lives in the hands of God, then we are truly safe and secure. No one can take us from that place. We have confidence in God. We have confidence because he is our faithful creator. Church creed has always affirmed this. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. The Bible teaches us that God made us in his own image. God made us fearfully and wonderfully. God made us and we are his. Confess I struggled with some of that in my teenage years particularly. See, school taught me evolution as part of science. As a child, it's difficult to disagree, isn't it? Because you believe that the teacher knows their subject. You know, whether it's French or maths or science. But this particular bit didn't agree with my Bible, so what was I supposed to do? You were made to feel stupid if you believe that God is our creator. It took time. It took time, first of all, to have the confidence to actually question anything and then time to look for evidence of God as our creator. Now, of course... Sincere Christians take quite a range of views in relation to creation. How long it took, when it happened, how much God created directly, how much God left to develop. And I'm not here to tell you this morning, this, this, this is exactly what you must believe. What I can tell you is this. After all my questions, after my months and months of wondering about things, I'm in the place where I enjoy the ways in which science can sometimes help us to see what a remarkable world we live in. And I am fully confident that God is its creator and mine. And that's why I have total confidence to commit my life to God. Since the Lord is our creator, then he's able. He can do all things. So therefore, he can strengthen us through every trial. What Peter writes is not just that he is able, he's our creator, but he writes that he is sure to do this. He is our faithful creator. And as we've been sharing with our stories with one another, what a wonderful truth that is. Even in the painful trial, even in our moments of tears, in the times when we just don't understand, we can't see what God is doing, we trust that he is faithful. Did the Lord ever promise anything? The Bible tells us he always did it. Did the Lord promise to protect Hagar? He did it. Did the Lord promise to give Sarah a baby? He did it. Did the Lord promise to feed Elijah? He did it. Did the Lord promise to provide manna every day for 40 years for a whole nation? He did, and he did it. Did the Lord promise to give Jehoshaphat victory? He did it. Did the Lord promise to help Jeremiah through some very tough situations? He did, and he did it. The Lord made all of those promises and loads more, and he did everything that he promised. Because every time God promises to do something, God does it. And yet, there are times we struggle. The trouble is so great. The pain, hard to bear. 
trial really is fiery. Like Job's wife, we can struggle. She and Job lost everything. And then she saw her husband suffering physically. And after a while, she just suggested to him, why don't you just curse God and die? That would be better than this, wouldn't it? But Job would not. For God was his creator. God was faithful. Even when Job was suffering and could not understand what was going on. That's how we commit ourselves to God, trusting in his faithfulness. And we continue then to do good. Even though sometimes it's doing the good and the right thing that gets us into trouble. We keep doing it because that's what honors God. Peter writes to help us to develop a different attitude and response to trouble, adversity, suffering, trials, whatever we might want to call them. Suffering that we go through because we are Christian. He advises an attitude of joy rather than anger. He suggests an attitude of praise rather than a sense of shame. He reminds us of the privilege that we share the sufferings of Christ and one day we'll rejoice greatly when his glory is revealed. That's how we prepare for trials. That's how we face trials when they come. This is how we live in times of the fiery trials, the painful stuff. Remember, we are sharing with Christ. We look for his glory to be revealed. We commit ourselves to our faithful creator and we continue to do good. May God help us.